with we still uh, waiting for technical uh, part. Pak Meru sudah Pak? Sudah, start ya. Ah. I have changed my background now. <laughs> Waduh, noise, Pak. Hmm, delay itu. So we continue, uh, we start. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. The Honorable Associate Professor Eleanor Biner, the Honorable Dr. Lakofia Hawa as Head of Department of Agricultural Engineering, the Honorable Dr. Yusuf Wibisono as Head of Bioprocess Engineering Study Program, the Honorable All Lecture in Department of Agricultural Engineering Faculty of Agricultural Technology. And all of participants, welcome to online international guest lecture today. The topic today is microwave extraction of high value chemical from plants. To begin our lecture today, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Dina Wahyu Indriani as moderator. Then the second agenda is opening remark from head of Department of Agricultural Engineering. Please, Dr. Lakofia Hawa. Saya ulang, Pak. There is some uh, technical error. Oh, okay. Yubi, could you unmute your laptop so we can hear the voice from your speaker? Okay, maybe there is something problem, uh, error connection, because I already unmute my microphone, but, yes. the, but the video still doesn't hear some sounds. Yes, I, I can't hear that. Yeah, can you? yeah I'm sorry. <laughs> You're sorry. It's we are sorry because uh, our head of department uh, our head of department uh, have uh, some uh, agenda today, so we see the uh, video of uh, our uh, head of department remarks. 
So we try again for the for the remark from head of uh, Department of Agriculture and Engineering. Yubi, your microphone is muted. The Honourable Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Thank you very much for the wonderful remarks. Let me remind all of the participants that we have time until half past 4 p.m. Then we continue with the, the discussion. At this guest lecture today, the participants from 19 universities around Indonesia is now live streamed via YouTube. During discussion session, the participants are allowed to write the question via YouTube live chat and don't forget to subscribe. And the host will inform the lecture about the question. Thank you. Now the main agenda is the lecture. Before we begin, let me keep overview the curriculum vitae of our international guest lecture today. Her name is Dr. Eleanor Piner. She is Associate Professor in Faculty of Engineering, University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. Her biography that I found in official university website is she got a Master Engineering in Chemical Engineering from Imperial College of Science. Then she continued her PhD in Industrial Research Institute of Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia. Then she worked in contaminated land consulting before returning for, for academia. She held postdoctoral research position in Monash University and the University of Nottingham before joining the School of Chemical and Environmental Engineering of the University of Nottingham as an academic member of staff. She teach environmental risk assessment and contaminated land and her research area is the sustainable processing of natural material using microwaves. She has many publications of about microwave assisted extraction in various plants as the topic of material that published in high reputation international journal. Shortly, please welcome Dr. Eleanor. Time is yours. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, 
Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Shinta, for, for I guess, um, inviting me and uh, recommending me to your colleagues. And um, I'm really pleased to be talking to you all today. I've never spoken to so many people across such a wide, wide area. So um, I am actually a little bit nervous. And I do apologise if I speak maybe a little bit too fast. I want you to let me know. I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen. Now, <clears throat> do you see that? So today I'm going to talk about uh, some advances that we've made in our group in microwave assisted extraction um, in the last few years. And thank you very, very much for the, the really lovely introduction. So it's going to save me a little bit of time today. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the University of Nottingham, um, our research group, and a little bit about me, although that's very kindly and very well been done by Dina already. And then I'm going to explain a little bit of fundamentals about what, what microwaves uh, are and how they work and how we can apply them in our field, which is, of course, valorizing biomass. And I think all of you are, are, are interested in that area. Um, and then some more focus on actual understanding microwave assisted extraction and then a couple of case studies at the end of things we've worked on. Um, and, and then obviously some time for some questions. So about me, I'm not going to go into detail because uh, uh, Dina has very accurately already been through all of these details. I'll just show you. So this is when I was at the industrial research of Swinburne at the turn of the century. <laughs> so I've come a long way since then. This is one of the sites that I worked on when I worked in contaminated land. It was the uh, at the time, at least, the largest oil, land based oil spill in the southern hemisphere. So that was kind of a proud moment for me. And I helped to commission the, a large remediation plant on that one. This is when I was a researcher at, 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 in Australia. This is, in fact, a, a lab visit to Japan where I spent <clears throat> some weeks collaborating with some researchers in Japan. So I did have a really great time, and I just need to move that. Uh, and this is. Um, a large open cut mine in Australia and, and my focus of research when I was a researcher in Australia was 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 coal. So I've, I've worked in a wide range of, of different uh, industries with the, I guess, the common, <coughs> raising my voice already, uh, the, the common theme of, of, of environmental uh, sustainability and also heterogeneous materials. So everything I've worked on has been complex solids. Um, the slide isn't going. OK, so um, since 2011, I've been at the University of Nottingham. We call ourselves Britain's Global University. This is the Trent Building in uh, the UK, which is our iconic building. And the university was founded by Jesse Boot. Um, I'm sure you, you've probably heard of Boots the Chemist. It's a, it's a very large chemist chain in the UK um, in uh, 1928. Uh, with, and, and he had, a, for the time, a really great vision of a university devoted to, to discovery, enterprise, and the advancement of the human condition combined with his lifelong commitment to improving health and well-being. So he, he, he really was in line with what our current vision is, which is being a university without borders and um, embracing a changing world and, and uh, uh, developing people and addressing global challenges. Um, we are, as I've said, uh, it's a little bit slow when I click, a global university. So we have international campuses. We have one in Malaysia and one in Ningbo. And both of those campuses also have the iconic Trent building. And we, we welcome students from those campuses to Nottingham and, and, and we do exchanges across those. And we try to collaborate with our research as well across those universities. And it really is a great place to work. And Nottingham is this is a map of England or the UK. Nottingham is right in the middle and it's most famous for Robin Hood, um, as some of you are aware. So please do come and visit. It's a lovely town. It's about half a million people live in Nottingham. It's quite spread out. Uh, you're never very far away from the countryside. So it's a nice place to live. So that brings us on to microwave processing at Nottingham. It's it's a quite a large research area. And it's interesting because we're not just one research group. We work across a range of research groups. So it's a very multidisciplinary research area across the Faculty of Engineering. We work on everything from a few grams of materials all the way up to tonne scale. So we, we do uh, really focus on getting fundamental understanding of how uh, microwaves work at very small scale and then using that information to, to design and build microwave processes. There are about 45 people working in this area and in our research group, the one that I and Shinta are in, uh, we have uh, 15 
roughly 15 people working within that research group, which is the Low Carbon Energy and Resource Technologies Research Group. So this is a picture of some of our facilities to give you an idea that it's not, we don't really, we're not really a normal lab, as most people think of labs. We do have small small labs, uh, but we also have really big labs like this. We have world leading capabilities in, in uh, microwave processing, dielectric property measurement, which is understanding how microwaves interact with materials, and then everything else that goes along with that, including design out designing our own microwave processes and I didn't mention that these these are the these are the guys from the from the low carbon energy resource technology group um, takes a while when I click okay I'm not going to go through all of this this is just to give you an idea about what we do within our little group of 15 or so people and the approach that we take. So we very much take the approach of fundamental understanding being central to everything we do. So we do a lot of work trying to understand fundamentally how materials interact with microwaves and then how this impacts on the heat transfer within the materials and the mass transfer and the chemical kinetics. Um, we also spend a lot of time characterising the materials. And then this goes out to all of the applications that we look at. Can I have some feedback, please? When I move the mouse, does it just flicker around and not be helpful? Or can you see what I'm pointing at? Yes, we can see the pointed. So it's OK when I'm pointing? Yeah, Good. it's OK. Yeah. So uh, we work in, in a, a very uh, green one. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. The, the applications that we work in. So, uh, for example, you can use microwaves to sterilise materials. So what this means is that, as you know, agricultural project, products, they degrade very, very quickly. So uh, we can design mobile systems. Or This is one of the things I'm really interested in, to sterilise materials, to deactivate the enzymes immediately so that they can be then valorised for other things. And they can also be used to heat things up very quickly to disrupt physical structures. So this can be used as pretreatments as well. I'm not going to go into all of them. Today, we're going to focus on extraction from waste. The point that I want to make is that all of the fundamental understanding we work at, all of the students and all of the researchers, they work together as a team. And so the understanding they have works across all of the different um, kind of applications. And finally, that everything we're working at, if you look along the bottom, which is feeding into our decisions, is we're really focused on, in, on food waste reduction or more correctly, um, agricultural um, byproducts and and food industry co-products. And we're really interested in developing a circular economy. So this is not wasting anything in our system. And I think this is what you're all working towards too. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, what, why and how microwaves. So first of all, what, what are the potential applications of microwaves to valorize biomass? We're process engineers, your engineers too. So this is the way we look at things. We look at feedstocks, processes and products. And the feedstocks that we're interested in are very wide ranging. They're all, all as I've said, biomass co-products and byproducts. Um, I've just put a small list of the different feedstocks that we've worked on. And, and the diversity comes from what, what people are interested in, what, 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 what kind of wastes are out there. And uh, you see I have uh, cacao pods there because the reason Shinta is working with us is because uh, that, that is a relevant waste stream in your country. And so we're working together to try to find ways to valorise it. So all of these feedstocks, they have different properties and they have different values. So um, you can see that it's very overwhelming uh, understanding how each of these ones behaves differently. Um, microwave processing is a thermal process, right? So any thermal process can be done in a microwave. So this could be extraction, pretreatment, pyrolysis, stabilization, depolymerization even, and drying. Now we work on all of those except drying within our group. And we're really interested in trying to find novel products, especially from my point of view, which can have health benefits. So this could be antioxidants, which is what we're, we're interested in, in, in with the cacao pods. It could be developing new, new food supplements in the terms of prebiotics, which I'm going to talk about as one of the case studies later. So it's really wide ranging and, and, and how to focus our fundamental understanding when there are so many options um, is very difficult. So this is the current status of microwave biomass technologies that in terms of the sort of scale that you can find them in. So there is a technology called solvent free microwave extraction that was developed in France and there are many papers uh, around about a decade ago on this. Um, it is 
a solvent free process. So it's a bit like a big tumble dryer and this is only scaled up to about five kilograms. This is, I'm going to show you this in more detail later, uh, um, a commercially available reactor that's used in labs. So I'll leave that now, but the other ones are industrial processes. So this is about the largest scale that you have for a continuous microwave extraction process. It's, it's owned by a Canadian company called Radiant, uh, and it's actually Serum Technology. Serum is a major French microwave manufacturer. Again, this one is developed by a Mar friend of mine, Marilena Radiou, who used to work for Serum for many, many years. Um, you will notice if you have a very large batch reactor like this, you have to have a microwave transparent solvent. So it's not suitable for green solvents because green solvents all have high dielectric properties. So this is only suitable um, for really for toxic solvents. And this is a process that we have developed at Nottingham or we have helped to develop. It's actually in Norway and it's a it's a. Um, pyrolysis rig and the reason I put it in there is it shows that it, if you have very uh, clever reactor design you can actually pyrolyze wood like this without adding any other um, microwave additions but not the subject of today's talk. So this is the kind of state of the art at the moment with uh, industrial microwave processes. As you see there aren't very many of them and they're not very big. This green one down here does up to um, 800 kilograms a day. So how do microwaves work? I was explaining this to my eight-year-old daughters <laughs> the other day, and I, I was explaining how microwaves are just like light. They're just on the electromagnetic spectrum, and the longer they are, um, you have for um, radio waves, and then the very, very short ones, as you know, are ionizing, so these are gamma rays and X-rays, and microwaves are at the long, end of the visible spectrum, which means they are non-ionizing. So all they do is heat you up or heat things up. They don't ionize anything, okay? So my eight-year-old says, and we're a stingrays on the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so um, stingrays aren't on there, but I think maybe I should put stingrays on there somewhere. Um, when we talk about microwave heating, we're talking about the, the red one. So the electric field is what heats in microwave heating. The magnetic field um, is used in induction heating, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about using the electric field to actually heat things. Um, within the microwave uh, frequency range, we are um, have two main mechanisms. We have one called dipolar loss. Um, or dipolar polarization and one called conductive loss. So dipolar loss uh, is is a highest at the characteristic frequency at which the um, the dipolar molecule can flip. So it has a, what we call a relaxation frequency. So in the case of water, it's around 20 gigahertz. So in fact, the, the dielectric properties or, or microwaves interact the most strongly with water at around 20 gigahertz. Now your microwave oven at home works at 2.45 gigahertz and water is still uh, uh, very strongly lossy at that range. And the reason is that it has a natural dipole and the electric field causes it to flip. And when the frequency of the microwaves approaches the, the relaxation frequency it's the, the dipole is trying to keep up and it causes friction and it's the friction that actually heats heats up and the other major um, loss mechanism is conductive loss and this is caused by the presence of ions in the material so stuff, stuff like salt um, so electrons and ions um, they they move forwards and backwards with the electric field and again you get you get heat generated by this movement so those are the two major mechanisms so anything with a dipole that can move freely uh, and anything with ions will heat very well in the microwave. Microwaves therefore interact directly with the materials or load within the system, uh, resulting in what we call volumetric and selective heating, which I'm going to explain now when it moves. Okay, so dielectric properties are really important to understand how materials will interact with microwaves. They define the microwave interaction, so how they will store and convert microwaves to heat. So um, epsilon single prime is the dielectric constant and that uh, describes how a material will store microwaves. And the double prime is the loss factor, so that explains how that stored energy is then converted into heat. So when I'm, because I'm 
generally interested in fundamental understanding and my colleague John Robertson is more interested in the scale up. I'm interested in the loss factor because that tells me how things are going to heat up. OK, so a high loss factor. So if we look at, at this, um, I've lost my mouse. If we look at this graph on the y axis, we have the loss factor. You can see, say, a potato has a very high loss factor. Potato heats really, really well in the microwave. Then you have distilled water because of the, the dipole. pole. Um, water has a very high loss factor. Something like ethanol, which is another commonly used, uh, considered to be green solvent. Now, if you look at something like hexane, which is a less green solvent, it has a low loss factor. So this means that when we're thinking about extraction, we'll have very different things going on. And if we're trying to de design green <laughs> solvent extraction systems, what we're looking at is solvents that have very high loss factors, so they will heat very, very quickly. This is great, obviously, <laughs> for some reasons, but um, and you'll see in a moment why, but with increasing dielectric properties, we have decreasing penetration depth. So if you think about, if you've ever tried to heat mashed potato up in your microwave, although it should heat throughout the whole material, and many people say it heats from the inside out, in microwaves do, that's because they heat directly throughout the bulk of the material. However, potatoes have such a high dielectric loss that the microwaves only get about a centimetre into it. So if you've ever tried to heat it up in the microwave without stirring it frequently, you just find the outside gets completely dried out and really hot and disgusting and the inside stays cold and this is why because the the penetration depth of very high loss materials um is very low and something like mashed potato has very poor heat transfer properties so the inside just stays cold okay so these dielectric properties to make it more difficult for us when we're designing our experiments they vary with temperature frequency uh, moisture content because it, the moist materials heat really well chemical composition um, configuration and state. So if you look at ice, the snow here, it has the same chemical formula as water, but it has very low loss factor. That is because it's in a, it, it, it's immobile when it's frozen, it can't move, so we don't get the friction effects. So you can't just look at the chemical composition, you have to look at the configuration, whether it's in a crystal structure or whether the electrons or ions can, can move around. Um, and finally, on this slide, uh, I want to show you um, this equation. So the power conversion or the power density that is generated in a material, which as engineers, you understand that uh, delta Q equals MC delta theta. So the amount of energy that you put into a material is related to the temperature rise by the heat capacity. Right, so this is the other side of that equation. So this is the amount of energy that goes into the material. So if you know this, you can work out the temperature rise if you know the heat capacity. Oh, sorry, I clicked by accident. So the amount of heat that, that uh, is converted into a material is reliant on 2 pi, which obviously we can't change. The frequency, which in any experiment will be set usually to 2.45. Um, we can't change that. This is the loss factor and this is the electric field intensity. So the loss factor depends on the material. So the higher the dielectric loss, the more power will go into that specific part of the material. And the electric field intensity is determined by the incident power. So what you set your microwave to, but also how you design your microwave. And we're gonna talk briefly about that in a minute. So really in any experiment, the loss factor is extremely important in determining what the temperature rise is. So I mentioned before, there are really two uh, mechanisms that arise from from uh, from microwave heating. And the first one is volumetric heating, which means that as opposed to in conventional heating, where we take a material, we heat the outside, and then we have to rely usually on conductive heating if we're talking about a biomass. Oh, someone else is sharing. Shall I just share again? Can you see that? See that. See that. We can okay, see that. cool. Uh, so where was I? So I'm talking about conventional heating on the left-hand side. In a biomass, 
it has very poor heat transfer properties, as you all know, which means that it's usually in conventional heating, it takes a long time to heat the inside. So we have to rely on heating um, the container, which then will heat the biomass and then con conductive heating will um, heat the middle. So often in conventional heating, it takes a very long time to heat things up and the outside ends up getting overheated or, or if you have a thermally sensitive materials, that means that they degrade while the inside hasn't heated up enough. Whereas in volumetric heating, we can heat throughout the bulk instantaneously, obviously with the caveat that the penetration depth will stop the microwaves going uh, all, all the way through a very large material. So within the penetration depth, you will get instantaneous volumetric heating. So everything will heat up the same amount. This um, is not heating from the inside out as some people think. The reason they think that is because if you heated up this test tube and you heated everything the same, obviously there will be heat loss from the outside of the material to the environment, which means that the inside would actually be hotter than the outside. So it, is, it can get the reverse effect of conventional heating. Now, selective heating, the heating rate of different phases within the material varies depending on their dielectric properties. May I ask what time we started so I know if I'm talking too too long? No, that's okay. No, that's okay. Okay, right. <laughs> I think we started maybe at five two or something. I'll I'll make sure I don't talk too long anyway. Tell me if I am. Yeah. So um if we have a transparent material which has very low loss, very low dielectric properties, the microwaves will travel straight through them. So this is air, ceramics, quartz, PTFE and that sort of thing. So often we, we design glass or quartz reactors when we're heating things in microwaves because they're microwave transparent. Things like metals will reflect microwaves, so they won't penetrate through them, they'll just reflect off them. So what we're interested in, in microwave processing is at the bottom where they absorb to a certain degree. So what happens is, depending on the dielectric properties, the energy will be converted into heat within the material, and eventually the, the microwaves will be attenuated down to a point um, where the intensity is so low they're essentially um, completely dissipated. And this is for things like water, foods, biomass, and plastics. Some plastics, not all. Okay, so I hope this video is going to work. Now, I'm not going to give a, a really detailed class on microwave cavity design. I think it's really helpful to understand these things, though. So when we design microwave experiments, it's really important for us to understand what electric field is that we've applied to our samples so that we know then uh, how that's going to actually heat the material up and, and then correlate that with what happens. So we tend to use single mode cavities which means that they're about half a wavelength long, so that, can you see that? You are getting a really nicely well-defined electric field, so you get a standing wave pattern, and if you put the sample in the middle of the cavity, you know that it's going to be getting the maximum um, electric field, and you can correlate that to your results. So the advantage of this is it's very well controlled, and we, we can understand if we turn the power up, we know the electric field will increase and we know that the sample has, has uh, all received a relatively even amount of electric field. The disadvantage is that is only half a wavelength uh, and, 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 and the cavity size is therefore determined by the wavelength. Now, the wavelength in your 2.45 gigahertz um, oven at home is 12 centimetres. So a single mode cavity is six centimetres wide. Okay, so it's not very big. So this has implications on scale up. Uh, you can scale up to around 900 megahertz and this brings the wavelength to 30 centimetres so you can then have a 15 centimetre uh, cavity. Okay, but you have to be aware that you can't just make a bigger one in the same way that you can in, in some industrial processes. Now, I should have probably put this slide first. This is the multi-mode cavity. Now, this is what you have in your domestic microwave oven at home. It, it doesn't have a specific size. The number of resonating modes is called the figure of merit and depends on the size of the cavity. So you can make it bigger and bigger and you will just get microwaves bouncing around in a relatively random fashion. When you put the sample in, this affects the, the electric field as well. That's why you have a turntable 
because otherwise you're going to get hot spots within your sample. So that's why it's really important to put your sample in the right place in your microwave oven. And it has to be designed to take a wide range of loads because you put any sort of food in your in your microwave at home. That's why you need to have a, a multi-mode cavity. Single mode cavity wouldn't be appropriate. But what you have to realise is that the electric field is relatively random then so if you're using it for lab experiments you don't know what the electric field was and it's very difficult to increase or decrease the electric field because it depends on so many different things so it's really great for, for heating up large samples if you just want to get it hot but if you want to understand what the electric field is doing it's very difficult so why why do we want to apply microwaves to biomass valorization so now i hope that's been helpful in giving you some basic understanding to understand our motivation in doing these things. So we have volumetric heating, as we've explained. So volumetric heating means that you can get really, well, instantaneous heating throughout the bulk. This can have huge advantages in, in processing. Uh, you get a very fast heating rate and a controlled heating profile. This means that you can design really, really small processes. You can have microwave processes that are a thousand times smaller than conventional heating processes um, because of this instantaneous heating. So as engineers, you understand that if, if you can have a really a much smaller residence time, you can shrink down, you can intensify. So it has really huge uh, implications for process intensification. And this also means that you can then design mobile processes because I mean we have we have got um, an, an oil and gas uh, process that's actually designed to go into two containers in its 100 kilowatt microwave system um, and that means that it can go onto an oil platform um, compared with the conventional heating which is the, literally the size of my house the furnace that they need for that specific application so it can make really small um, small processes because of this really rapid heating um, this can lead to energy savings as well, but the energy savings are not because you're saving on heat capacity. Heat capacity is always the same. It always takes the same energy to reach a certain temperature. But if everything's smaller and quicker, then the heat losses are a lot less. So you can get energy savings from that. And you can also control reaction and degradation kinetics. And for me, in my area of research, that is the probably most important thing from the volumetric side. Selective heating. Biomass is selectively heat, even in water. Um, this is not conventional wisdom, but we have shown this in recent years. So this means that you can get, um, um, if, if you heat a biomass in water or in a solvent, the biomass may be hotter than the solvent. So this may lead to some different reaction kinetics and different degradation kinetics. And it may, and, and it's widely believed, to cause physical disruption in the biomass structure. So I've put there the picture of the donut, just so that you can really understand the power of selective heating how many of you um, you just have to answer in your head have ever put a donut in the microwave heated it for like 20 seconds you get it out and the dough's gone all soft and lovely and you bite into it and you burn your mouth because the the jam inside has got it, it, through ionic heating <laughs> has got um like lava like uh, heat so many people think this effect can lead to to physical disruption by for example, the generation of steam within biomass. Now, a lot of my research area is focusing on looking at this. So we, we may have the potential to actually physically disrupt these mechanisms and this increases the yield or maybe the extraction time um, when we're talking about extraction, which is what, what you're all interested in. And finally, zero carbon processing is now really important. The UK is the first G8 country to commit to legally to uh, zero carbon and they've committed to do this by 2050. Now, if you think about the scale of industry, things like the brick industry, the energy industry, they all rely on thermal processes that are run with fossil fuels. Now the advantage of microwaves is that they're run by electricity which can be run renewably so it can be a zero carbon energy source. So microwave technology could play a really major role in replacing fossil fuel processes in the future. Now, so applying this to microwave assisted extraction, which is what you're all interested in, there are uh, over a thousand papers on this in the last decade or so. Um, many, many papers say that it gives you reduced extraction times, better products, faster heating, energy savings, all of the things that I've explained, flexible operation, smaller, uh, a lot of them say you can use green solvents, a lot of them say you can use less solvent. 
um, enhanced extraction through cell rupture and, and obviously, as I've said, the ability to use sustainable energy resources. However, if you do carefully controlled experiments where the only difference is using a microwave or thermal heating for extraction, almost all of the time you don't see any real difference in, in the yield or the extraction time. No, um, you have to design the experiments very, very carefully. And in some, some feedstocks don't seem to be able to get an increased yield under any conditions. So despite there being over a thousand papers on this, that, and this is why there are very few industrial scale examples, because there just isn't that fundamental understanding of how to get these advantages. Uh, and this is because of the way experiments are designed. They often don't have that fundamental understanding. So the range of conditions that they're, they're looking at, and they're often using a multi cavity, they just can't exploit the microwave selective heating effect. So when I started looking at this area in 2014, that was my starting point, um, we decided to start doing some fundamental research to understand it. I'll just put a couple of slides in here before we talk about that. This is, this, these are the commercially available re reactors that, that some of you may have in your labs for microwave assisted extraction. Now these are single mode cavities, so um, there's a range of different manufacturers that you can buy them. I've just uh, put two there. We like using the mini flow in our lab and the reason we like using the mini flow is because we can actually, uh, it, it's a single mode cavity and we can control the forward and reflective power and, and uh, record that, which means that we know how much power actually went in. So you get really good temperature control. So the blue line is the forward power and uh, the red line is the reflected power. So you can see that it can be tuned so that almost all of the power does go into the sample. You can get a really nice, well-controlled temperature profile there. And once you hit the set temperature, you have to realise that actually very little microwave power goes in. It just blips on and off to maintain the power. So really, uh, the key time is the ramp up period. These uh, are also commercially available that you can do extractions in. The advantage is that you can do larger samples. The disadvantage is they're multi mode cavities, so you don't really know how much power and you can't control the electric field as well in these, in these systems. So I'm going to go back to some fundamentals of um, solvent extraction. So forget we're using a microwave. I think you all understand what solvent extraction is. So we're putting a solid material, which is uh, in many cases some type of agricultural waste, into a solvent, and we're hoping to extract a valuable compound. The compound could be uh, inside the cell, so something like polyphenols, or it could be in the cell wall, something like pectin. Okay, And, and the basic principle of this is that the, uh, the solvent, the liquid, has to diffuse up to the surface of the solid. It then has to diffuse throughout the material until it gets to wherever it uh, the the, uh, the solute is that that, we're, that the target extract is. And then there's some type of solubilization or desorption process that uh, has to happen. And then the process is reversed. The solute dissolves into the solvent, and then through um, osmotic pressure. It, 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 it equilibrium processes diffuses out back into the liquid. Okay, so how could microwave heating affect this process? Can volumetric heating uh, give some advantages? It's generally agreed that in CSE, which in this paper was the acronym for conventional solvent extraction, the heat transfer um, has to come in, while, whereas the mass transfer has to go out, whereas in microwave um, extraction, the heat transfer and the mass transfer are in the same direction. So that's a generically accepted truth, but there's no real uh, attempt to model or understand how that really affects outcomes. And then what selective, can selective heating have some sort of advantage? And I've had, as I've already said, there's a general agreement that, that microwaves should be able to rupture cells somehow, and this may cause an increase in yield or a decrease in extraction time. But again, up until recently, there's been very little attempt to explain how this could happen. And just to complicate matters, I'm going to remind you that your green solvents 
ideally water, often ethanol, but really there aren't many other solvents that can be considered green. They all have really high dielectric properties. So uh, on the left, we have the case of a solvent that has high dielectric properties. And the conventional understanding has been that the solvent will heat and the biomass wouldn't heat selectively. Now, we, we challenge that in our research, but the point is that the whole system is going to be at the at or near the set temperature. Whereas if you had um, a microwave transparent solvent such as hexane, you could have the, the situation where a very tiny amount of energy could actually lead to really strong heating of the biomass, whereas the solvent actually didn't heat at all. As I pointed out though, generally, unfortunately, we don't want to use those solvents because they're not um, as environmentally safe as using water. So you need to bear this in mind when you're thinking about understanding these processes. Okay, this is really hard to explain, but I'm going to give it a go. This is um, a really, really, really simplified version of conventional solvent extraction. Imagine that you have a solvent, which is water, for example, and you all understand, you've learned this at school, that um, mass transfer in solids like this is driven by osmosis. So it's driven by the osmotic potential. So the, the, os the osmotic potential of water outside the biomass is higher than inside, so therefore it moves into the biomass and, the, and then it moves into the cell. And then some type of um, solubilization or desorption happens and then the solute which is now dissolved into the solvent um, the osmotic potential of that is higher in the cell than in the solvent so therefore the solute diffuses out into the bulk of, and that's how generally um, it's called solution diffusion theory and that's generally accepted um, understanding of solvent extraction now this only applies for constant temperature because in conventional heating the temperature of the system is all the same However, um, we started thinking about this and in 2016 we, we published a paper on this, which is the chemical engineering science reference that I've put down there. We started thinking about what would happen if you could selectively heat the material inside the cell. So the temperature inside the cell and inside the biomass is higher than the temperature in the solvent. What would happen? So we had to go back because osmotic potential no longer applies because as well as there being concentration gradients, there's temperature gradients. So we had to add in the temperature gradient um, equations into the um, theory of osmosis. So it's no longer called osmotic potential, we're calling it chemical potential, which is a more fundamental property, um, which isn't um, only for constant temperature. Uh, it has it can apply to varying temperature as well. So when we did these equations, what we found, which was counterintuitive actually, we were surprised, what happens is the chemical potential inside the cell of water, if it's hotter, drops. And this is because if, if you think about it, when something heats up, it expands. So the chemical, uh, the chemical potential drops, so water actually gets sucked in faster. So the equilibrium process is kind of enhanced with selective heating. So if this gets hotter than this, then the water is sucked in more quickly. So then we supposed, although at this stage we couldn't prove it because biomass is a very complicated system, that this may actually lead to the buildup of pressure that may be able to rupture cells. And what we did in this paper was we did some very basic calculations. Uh, if you refer to literature 70 bar, is accepted as being maybe the pressure that a cell will rupture at. And we sh we showed that only a few degrees of temperature difference could actually lead to a buildup of water um, um, that may plausibly rupture the cells. So we came up with this theory in 2016, as I've said. Now, it's I'm not going to say completely impossible because we're working on it, but it's difficult to demonstrate this um, and prove it in biomass, which is so complicated. So we have actually shown that this theory works in, in a desalination experiment where we put water on one side and salty water on the other side. And we actually uh, made reverse osmosis happen just by using temperature gradients as opposed to pressure, which is the normal way of desalinating. So we have proved the principle, but it's extremely difficult to um, prove in a biomass solvent system that this is what's happening. So what we've done um, is we've built a model. This is ongoing work and really exciting. Um, 
this is done by a student called Ali Taki. I've put a picture of him there. Uh, it's a few years old. He, he's it's not quite as useful as he is there. And we've recently published this. So what he's done is he's trying to demonstrate that this really can work in solvent extraction. I'm not going to go into the details. I don't have time today. But he's built um, a, a model of biomass where he um, he puts in the number, the dimensions and the shape and the orientation and, and he uses as real data as he can about the, the cell elasticity and all the mechanics of rupture and all of these things. And he builds it up um, with size. And because we're a multidisciplinary group, other people, other researchers in the group have then measured the dielectric properties of biomass materials for him to put into his model. Now, um, the, the base case that we use is onion, and the reason we do that is because onion cells uh, can, can uh, well, there's a lot of data about them and they can easily be observed under a microscope. So what we've shown, and you may mention that I said before that the conventional wisdom is that biomass is actually inert um, to microwaves if it's dry. What we've shown actually is that when you put biomass into the solvent, because you have to measure things in the condition that they're going to be in. So biomass isn't dry when it's in a solvent because the solvent's inside it. So when we've measured it in as close to the conditions as we can that it's going to be in, we found that just about every biomass still has higher dielectric properties than water. So even in water, which has very high dielectric properties, you still get a very slight degree of, of um, selective heating. So what he's done is he then, as you recall from this equation before, we can relate the dielectric loss to the actual power that goes into the sample and therefore the selective heating in the models. And then that power is then related back into the sensible heating equation. If you know the heat capacity, you can then know the temperature rise. So he can, he has actually for the first time with real experimental data modeled how hot biomass will get in real systems, or real ish in his model system. And to cut a lot of steps out of the story, what he's shown is that you can get, um, and it's fairly obvious that the larger the biomass sample, the more selective heating you will get because you get heat transfer going out, you get heat loss out. So if you have a large enough sample, for example, this size, uh, a 0.3 millimeter piece of biomass, which actually is a realistic size for, for a microwave assisted extraction experiment, you could get under the most probably extreme heating conditions in a single mode cavity, which most people don't have uh, around a 10 degree temperature rise. But if you recall, we only needed one or two degrees to, to get this, uh, what we call temperature induced diffusion effect um, that we're interested in. So that's the first step. He's shown that you can get selective heating and, and, and he's put it into a model so we can do some experiments. So then, um, we wanted to demonstrate whether this would have the effects on mass transfer that we've hypothesized that they do. So he's got the temperature gradient in his model, and then he puts that in to calculate the chemical potential gradient, as I've explained, which is which is um, variable on the concentration and the temperature. And then this translates into water flow between the cells and pressure buildup. Um, and we've, as I've said, we've recently published this paper and we've shown that we really do think that this temperature induced diffusion theory is plausible. And finally, so as I've alluded to, he has shown that a couple of degrees of temperature gradient could indeed plausibly lead to pressures that could plausibly lead to cell rupture. So um, uh, do I need to go into any of this detail? So uh, a so when asking the question, can a small temperature gradient induce these large cell pressures? Um, because plant cells are resistant to expansion due to rigid cell walls. I think I've gone ahead of myself a little bit. And liquid, uh, e.g. water, is incompressible. This means that high pressures are induced upon the flow of liquid into the biomass cells, and it is plausible. So to summarise, this is really exciting because we're starting to understand that selective heating really can enhance microwave assisted extraction and under what conditions. So this is ongoing work. He's now building a um, cell wall and a much more detailed mass transfer into this model. Um, so this isn't the end, this is just the beginning, but we can now start to design experiments based on this knowledge of the conditions required to exploit this effect. And, and so therefore, hopefully hone in on the conditions required so that we're not publishing a thousand papers before we start to see and understand the effects of microwaves in our experiments. Um,
OK, so I have two case studies. I realise I've probably already been speaking for a long time, but I thought it was worth spending a bit more time on the fundamental understanding. And I maybe won't go into too much detail on these. It's just to give you a flavour of of um, work we're doing. So I'll just go back. So first of all, polyphenol extraction for antioxidant products. This is uh, really common. And I, I use this as a case because these are inside the cell and we get different results when we look at trying to extract things from the cell wall as we do from inside the cell. So um, what we've shown is, and if you just look at, to start with what the project was, so C. buckthorn leaves, they are, um, the reason we worked on these is because we had a student come from Romania and a local farmer was farming sea buckthorn berries and he wanted to see if there was anything useful he could do with the waste, which was the leaves. So she came to us because she wanted to do some microwave assisted extraction experiments on these. And well, as I've mentioned, there are many papers on this and, and often it's difficult to understand the difference. Uh, or, or what the advantage is. And the reason is that often they've used a completely different reactor to do the conventional experiments as the as the microwave experiment. So any differences we see, it's really, really difficult to understand whether it was because it was the microwave that they used and in fact what the electric field was and, or whether it was because the, the reactor was smaller and therefore the, obviously they got a faster heating rate and less um, a smaller cool down time, so less degradation of the material. So what we did for the first time was we got exactly the same reactor size and we actually controlled it so the heating rate was the same. We did this by putting um, uh, heating an ethylene glycol bath up to, I think, 150 and then dropping the conventional heating reactor into there so that we got the same heating rate. So any differences we saw were definitely from selective heating, not from the fact that you had a different sized reactor or a different stirring regime or something. And what we saw rather disappointingly in, let's say, A, so at 40 degrees, you get exactly the same results. So TPC is um, the total phenolic, so it's a, a, and it's it's actually a gallic acid that you're measuring. So it's it's an indication of how many, f roughly how many phenolics are extracted from the material. And you can see if you increase the extraction time, the yield of TPC increases. And for MAE, microwave assisted extraction, and CSE, you've got exactly the same yield for every extraction point. The extraction time doesn't appear to be changed by microwaves at all. Um, if you increase the temperature to 60 degrees. Again, you might be seeing a very slight increase in yield for the microwaves, but there's no increase in extraction time, or maybe a very slight one. OK, but we still in these experiments after 800 seconds, we still haven't reached maximum extraction. Now, if you increase the temperature to 80 degrees C, you do start to definitely see an increase in the yield. It's around 10 to 15 percent. Um, increase in yield at around 450 seconds. And you can also see that that was the optimum extraction time, whereas for, for the conventional one, the, the, it took longer to reach the optimal extraction time. Now, this is really interesting findings and the first time this has been shown. Now, if you look now at the um, graph in the bottom right hand corner, we measured the dielectric loss. We measured the dielectric loss first of the solvent, which was 50% water and 50% ethanol. And that's the squares. And you can see that as the temperature increases, the dielectric loss of the solvent decreases. And likewise for the sea buckthorn leaves, which were measured in their natural moisture content, which was uh, but in the solvent. So 67% moisture content of solvent. So that's as close to the actual reaction conditions as possible. It also decreases with temperature, but not as quickly, which means that above around somewhere between 50 and 60 degrees, the dielectric properties of the biomass actually exceed the solvent. So you'll get selective heating above that temperature. Now that correlates really nicely with where we saw the advantage of microwaves. So this is the first ever evidence that actually selective heating, if you can make selective heating happen in these experiments, you can increase the yield, you can get some benefit. And this is the first paper that ever showed this because no one had ever actually very, very carefully and systematically done the experiments like this before. Um, so this was really exciting. We published this in, in 2017. And this is from a, a Romanian student called Anna Galan who spent uh, I think three or only six months with us, but we, we worked for a long time after she left 
uh, writing this paper. So that was a really nice success story. And it's led to um, more things. In fact, Shinta, uh, who, who many of you know as your lecturer, uh, she's currently researching with us at the University of Nottingham, looking at extracting polyphenols from cacao pods. So she's read this paper. She's probably knows this paper better than anyone because she's used it to help to design her experiments. Now, I'm, I'm not going to share any of her results with you. With you, she can she can do that later. Um, it, she's in her second year now, but I can tell you that she's getting some really promising results. So she's also a lecturer in the bioprocess engineering at the I can't say it Brawi Jawa University, um, and she's currently a PhD student with us and working in our research group, and she has a scholarship. Um, there's a bit of a delay. And what she's doing is she's looking at the challenge of um, cacao pod husks in Indonesia. So there are estimated about 420,000 tonnes uh, might be discarded every year. So and only a small portion of this is directly used as a fertiliser or animal feed. So the rest of it is, is wasted. So she's looking at finding some applications with this um, and uh, she's focusing on microwave assisted extraction to do this so uh, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to collaborate with some of you guys and also the indonesian coffee and uh, cocoa research institute for for cacao waste valorization so that's a really exciting project that we're working on and uh, this is the last case study this is really my main most exciting research area for me and this is towards clean extraction of hairy pectin now, as you gather, this is multidisciplinary research. So lots of people are involved. This is Fatima, Yujia, Mohammed, Miguel and, and me, obviously. We, that's just from the University of Nottingham. We've also worked with people from the University of Reading and also um, a local potato uh, company called Branston, who have a lot of waste potatoes. So that's a very UK waste potatoes. So we're interested in hairy pectin. For those of you who don't know, you probably are aware that pectin is extracted from orange peels and apple pomace uh, conventionally already at industrial scale. Now, the pectin that's extracted is, is what's shown on the left here as the HG region. So it's a, it's a polysaccharide with a repeating backbone of galacturonic acid. And then it's, it, it's got um, methylated and acetylated side groups. But it's, it's referred to as smooth pectin because it's just a very long polymer, really, and very regular. Now, that is extracted uh, conventionally. And that is what you think of when you get pectin to, to put in your jam, for example. Now, hairy pectin is RG1 and RG2. Now, this is actually uh, an alternating galacturonic acid and rhamnose backbone, RG1 is, which is the one we're interested in. And it's decorated with these neutral sugar side trains, so um, galactose and um, arabinose. And this is what we're interested in. You also have, uh, and so about 60 to 70 percent of all pectin is smooth pectin. Uh, around 30 percent is RG1, which is the hairy pectin we're interested in. And then a small percentage is, is RG2, which I won't talk about. And it, I think these are uh, hemicellulosis, although I'm not a biochemist. Um, so we're interested in hairy pectin. And the reason we're interested in hairy pectin is there are emerging uses of hairy pectin derived products. There are some publications showing uh, the inhibition of cancer biomarker galetin 3 and also other publications that show it has prebiotic potential. Um, this has only been demonstrated in vitro though, in small scale. And the reason for this is that it's very difficult to extract hairy pectin. Now you might be thinking, well, but they conventionally extract pectin. And they do, but the conventional industrial scale extraction is it's a hot acid extraction and it destroys these neutral side chains, which are the ones which have this bioactivity that we're interested in. So um, currently, you can extract hairy pectin in small quantities using enzymatic processes. Enzymatic processes are very expensive. Um, so we can't 
kind of have a bag of hairy pectin to do tests on. And that's why this collaboration started, because I met someone called Bob Rassel from the University of Reading um, at, at an event, and he was saying, oh, I'd love to be able to get more of these things so I could do human trials. They have these amazing gut models at the University of Reading where they can simulate what's going to happen if you give these to a person and, and understand what the health benefits are. And that, so that's where this research has come from, me talking to somebody else, getting in their idea. So we really want a scalable method so that we can extract sufficient quantities to do these human trials. And that's where we come in. The pectin structure and hence its potential uses are dependent on the biomass feedstock, the extraction conditions and also the post extraction modification, which we don't do. That's our collaborators that do that. But what we do is we we, we spend a lot of time understanding how biomass feedstocks behave uh, and how they process and the extraction conditions. And that's what we need to do. So our aim in this work is to actually be able to, to uh, develop a, a clean, so we want to use water in other words, and we want to use microwaves because of the elect renewable energy from the electricity, a clean, scalable technology to develop these products. So the aims and objectives of this work are to valorize potato pulp pectin oligosaccharides to get pectin oligosaccharides to, to produce prebiotics and the process that we want is we want to be able to scale it up so ideally we'd like to have a continuous process um, if we can have a continuous process it means we can heat it up really quickly and cool it down really quickly and therefore minimize degradation now we've done a lot of, of work on sugar beet pulp really understanding this which i'm not going to talk about today but we really do understand that you have an optimal extraction time because it takes time to diffuse through, desorb and then remove the pectin because uh, it's a cell wall component. So it's a little bit harder to extract than, than the polyphenols which are within the cell. So we want to be able to do it really quickly. So a continuous process is great because you can, can pass it through the reactor and cool it down really quickly. Um, uh, we want to have low environmental impact. So we want to use water as a solvent and we want to, as I've said, preserve the hairy pectin. So have no degradation. Um, we want to have a continuous microwave system so that we can get this volumetric and fast heating to minimise the degradation. Um, also, we'd like to be able to exploit this selective heating or rupture, which means we want to be able to control the electric field so that we can actually get this temperature induced diffuse, diffusion effect that we've demonstrated at lab scale or in our model. Um, This is a really, really basic uh, description of the method. So we get the potato pulp from our industrial partner. In fact, it's really cool because they have waste potatoes and then they have their own process that they're developing to extract protein from their waste potatoes. So they already have uh, a side stream that they're trying to get value out of. So they're trying to extract protein already. And then we get the pulp. So they've already, in fact, removed most of the starch for us as well and the protein. So we have a waste of a waste stream. So this is like the best circular economy story ever. So we still, though, need to de-starch because we discovered early in the days that if we didn't de-starch, we heat it up, we get mashed potato. So we have to put some type of de-starching process in. So we've looked at uh, using amylase because everyone in the lab, they use amylase to remove starch. This destroys the starch, though, and, in, and adding enzymes also adds cost and more complications to the process. So uh, in developing this scaled up process, we've also looked at sieving the, sieving the starch out. And what this means is that um, obviously uh, it's a cleaner process, but you don't destroy the starch. So then you not have another valuable stream as well in the starch itself. We then do the microwave assisted extraction, um, which is essentially you get the potato pulp, you add water to it, you heat it up to a certain temperature, and then we have to remove the solids. So we filter it. And then we precipitate out the pectin. So, so you end up with um, a, a liquid which you add um, an alcohol to and the pectin precipitates out because it's not soluble in alcohol. So that separates it from the other extracts that, that might be in there. And then we analyse it using sugar analysis. Um, so to start with, we did some small batch experiments on a monowave, which, as you know, is a single mode cavity. Um, not going to show many results. It's just to show you the process. So to show you that um, here is the power. So the power uh, went up to 400 watts quite quickly. 
And then once we reach the set temperature, which was around 90 degrees, the power goes down and then they just put in a minimum amount of power to maintain the temperature. And look, it took four seconds to reach that temperature in the monowave. So it's got very, very rapid heating in there. Now, the extract. So we did a range of experiments to understand how, how long we had to heat the material for and, and what the feed concentration could be and what the power would be and all of this. And what we showed was that um, 20 minutes was a good extraction time. Uh, five minutes wasn't enough. And, and after 60 minutes, we'd seen some degradation. We showed that the feed concentration um, it, it was better to have a lower amount of feed. Now, in fact, the, the feed concentration was determined by the flow ability because when we're designing our continuous process, we actually had to measure the viscosity and the flow ability and work out what the most amount of potato we could get in there before it wouldn't flow anymore. So, in fact, that was a limitation. There was an engineering design limitation more than anything else. The microwave input power, um, we did see an increase in yield when we increased the power. And the most exciting thing was extraction is typically a batch process which takes a long time what we discovered was we can heat it and hold it for 20 minutes or we can heat it for one minute and then we can just keep it warm for 19 minutes and we get roughly the same yield and the advantage of this is that we can now do a continuous process we can pass it through the microwave one time and then we can just keep it warm in a holding tank for 20 minutes and get the same extraction as if we'd done it in a big batch reactor and heating it. We did, in, as you'll see, investigate um, continuous heating as well, but, but th th these were uh, used to then design a process. So I, I mentioned very briefly at the beginning, we do our own, we design our own uh, microwave experiments because you can't just use a bigger one. You need to understand what you're doing. So we designed a single mode cavity where the um, and it's a continuous system. It has a peristaltic pump with 250 mils per minute. So we put the um, untreated ap uh, apple, uh, the untreated potato pulp in here, and we move it through the peristaltic pump. It goes through the applicator. It's only a 10 millimeter wide tube because you will recall the penetration depth is very low. It's only the order of a centimeter. And I've put the uh, dielectric properties here to show you that. So the penetration depth across the whole range of temperatures is the triangle. And it is at reaction temperature is 12 millimeters. So you can't design one of those big things that I showed you at the beginning for this system and get the electric field you want. So we designed this like this so that it gets the even electric field as it goes through here. It was fairly difficult to make the power couple into such a small sample, but we managed to do it. OK, there's a lot of detail in here that's not shown. Now, this is a system that we have. So the microwave generator is here. It comes through here with uh, the power meters. The three stub tuner. It's, we like to say it's like a gearbox. So we move the tuners around and we move the sliding short backwards and forwards so that we can tune the um, the electric field onto the sample. Uh, you do have to adjust it at the beginning of each experiment to make sure that the electric field is in the right place and it's going into the sample. We did that anyway. We got really good temperature control and we ran it in two different operating modes, what we call single mass, single pass, and recirculation. So in single pass, we ran it through. We had like a one second, less than one second residence time in the reactor. And then we put it here and we held it for 20 minutes. And in recirculation. Sorry, sorry, Ellie. Ellie. Yes. <laughs> we have five, we have more, five minutes. more minutes. Yeah, this is the last yes. thing. OK. Um, so in recirculation mode, we would attach the outlet to the inlet so we could run it round and keep microwaving it for 20 minutes and maintaining it at the set temperature. And you can see from this one, we had really good temperature control here. So I'll move on. And this is what it looks like in the lab. You know, it's a real lab, so it's a bit messy. But um, and, and the point is that you have all of this massive equipment, but the sample just there, that's where it meets the microwave. <laughs> it's a really, really small, as I say, uh, six centimetre cavity, one centimetre sample. So the results showed, I won't, I'll maybe speed up a little bit then. So the the flash or the single pass and then the 
holding, which was the recirculation mode, and we compared it with a, a conventional experiment we did, which was the same volume. It's kind of not really a fair comparison because we just heated up a batch for 20 minutes on a hot plate. But what we showed actually was it appears that the extract yield is better in the batch experiments. However, when we did the sugar analysis, what we discovered is that the um, the microwave assisted extraction had the highest. So the Galay yield can be seen as um, a rough measure of how much pectin is in there of any type. It's not exactly like that. but So you can see that there were much more impurities in these samples. So if you look at the actual pectin yield, you can see that the single pass had a higher yield than the conventional one and the recirculated one. And you can also see that the sieved sample and the enzyme treated sample seems to have um, because in this one it looked like the enzymatic treatment was better but in fact that's because there was glucose so you can see from here this is the sugar analysis so what we're looking what we're interested in for hairy pectin is rhamnose and arabinose and galactose okay and you can see that the single pass one had the highest amount so we had the highest yield and we had the purest hairy pectin sample as well from this uh, process. So it's really exciting. So the yield, the simple message is the yield was more than doubled with single pass continuous system compared with batch. Oops. Uh, so we have a clean, scalable method to extract pectin. Um, now our partners in Reading, they have a bag of pectin, which they're doing these tests on, or they're going to be doing these tests on very soon. So we can demonstrate whether we really do have prebiotic potential, and then we can start to develop real products. So that's uh, all our really exciting research. So I hope you think it's exciting. I do. The summary is um, microwave assisted extraction is a potentially scalable technology, but the lack of understanding has led to low conversion of scaled up processes. Combining theoretical and experimental approaches in a multidisciplinary team, we are developing understanding using multidisciplinary team-based approach. And, and this knowledge extends beyond extraction to other applications. As you saw, we work as a team, so we have lots of people working on different things, and we all talk to each other and learn from each other. So I feel like microwaves could be part of the transformation of industry that we must have uh, to meet this commitment to zero carbon. Oh, I wrote 2015. <laughs> 2050. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I just want to um, show you the team because this is not just me. This is all of us. Um, this is all of these guys. And you can see Shinta there. So, some of you know Shinta. And uh, Ali is at the back there. And UG is there. They're the two who have done so much of this work and, and everyone. So thank you very much. I think that's it. I don't think I'll put a question slide, but thank yeah. you ever so yeah. much for listening. A lot of questions. Oh, lot of questions. Yes. oh my yes. God. Oh I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah. that was very interesting lecture that we learned today. Uh, that also uh, my colleagues, uh, Sinta Rosalia Dewi is working with you. It's very happy to see her in uh, your uh, project. And there is a uh, interesting lecture about the microwave extraction of uh, high value chemicals and including the various heating process that we can applicate in various plants. And uh, also you uh, make comparison between conventional solvent extraction and microwave extraction. Then now uh, we can continue about uh, discussion. So. Uh, I will show you that we have 197 participants <laughs> via YouTube. So there is a lot of people uh, now online via YouTube. And Thank you all for joining and yes. <laughs> making it to the end. Maybe say hi from all of Indone uh, around Indonesia. <laughs> okay. Uh, and... Uh, I will uh, read the some question. First question is uh, when we do the extraction of biomass by using solvent, the, dia the dialectic factor of the biomass and the solvent will be different. How it could be give effect to the yield? Can you catch my okay. question? Yeah, 
what is the difference it's, it's, between it's, it's, traditional it's, okay, or it's a very complicated answer and we don't know all of it what we think is like we've shown in the you remember the C buckthorn leaves paper and also in Jinta's work she's getting the same results we are finding that if you use the correct temperature where you do have selective heating so if you can understand when the dielectric properties of the solvent is less than the biomass that's when you can observe some type of advantage in yield um, we have other work which isn't published um, about pectin extraction from a range of materials so we, we published a paper a few years ago on extracting pectin from sugar beet and we discovered that um, no matter what we did we got the same answer <laughs> from conventional and, and microwave assisted oh, so, extraction so, can we so it's not the, for all biomasses sorry oh uh, so can we call it the green solvent something like that oh sorry what what you're asking green, uh green solvent about green solvent yeah so green solvents the greenest solvent is obviously water mm. water has a high loss but even so we still get selective feeding of biomass okay um but what we've done is say it's not just about the solvent because we looked at extracting pectin from um, orange peel sugar beet carrots um mango peel and apple pomace and we measured the dielectric properties of all of those materials and we observed that some of them have advantages with microwave and some of them don't and it's, it usually correlates with if you measure the material in water some of them do selectively heat and some of them don't so it's not like if it works for a banana it works for an orange <laughs> you have to compare oranges with oranges <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's very complicated. Yeah. It's very complicated. Okay. Uh, then uh, I will read down the from Villa Paramita from West Sumatra. What is the effect of microwave technology on the stability of bioactive compound extract extraction? Okay. So microwave is a thermal process. So you you may have read papers saying that there's some type of uh, microwave effect which is beyond the thermal process. We, in our group, we don't believe that's the case. We believe that it's just heating. That said, if the bioactive is got a high dielectric loss factor, it might overheat and therefore it might degrade more. To my knowledge, that most of them don't have really high dielectric properties, however. So in my opinion, microwave actually reduces degradation because you can heat really fast and cool down really fast. And personally, I think this has the biggest effect on the outcome. It's not the selective heating, it's the fact, the volumetric heating. You can heat very fast, you can cool down really fast, therefore you can minimize degradation. Oh, okay. Then the next question is, when we do extraction of biomass by using solvent, the electric factor of the biomass and the solvent will be different. How it could be give effect to the yield? So we've seen that it can increase yield slightly by 10 or 15 percent. It doesn't have a huge effect. Oh, it doesn't do. So yeah. the next question is about, do you have experience how to measure the temperature in microwave room correctly? <laughs> it's, it's notoriously difficult to measure temperature in a microwave. Mm, so okay. if you put a thermal couple into a microwave, it interacts with the electric field. So oh. normally in, um, for example, in a mini flow, the temperature is measured by, um, and Shinza is going to tell me if I'm wrong, <laughs> um, an IR uh, thermocouple, which means an inter infrared. Infrared only measures the surface of the reactor, okay? Uh -huh. So you're only measuring the outside. So typically you have a quartz or a Pyrex tube and, you, and the IR measures just the outside, so it doesn't measure the bulk right, temperature, so right. usually un, under measures. Now, in another one, the mono wave, which is the one we reported for the potatoes, we have a ruby thermometer inside, so it measures the actual temperature inside the reactor, but it can't measure 
any temperature differences between the cell and the solvent. It's just measuring the average or the bulk temperature. Oh, so it's very uh, difficult to know the temperature. Yes, so, and in many cases, if people mm -hmm. have reported magical microwave effects, it's because they didn't actually accurately measure the temperature because it's not possible. Mm, okay. So in the next question, uh, maybe my partner, UB, will be read the question. So please, UB, read the next question. Unmute your microphone. Okay, I'm sorry. No worries. Okay, the, and the fifth question is, when microwave-assisted extraction applied to biomass, you mentioned that the mass transfer mostly affected by chemical potential. However, the temperature gradient promotes the pressure enhancement. In this condition, which one more dominant for extraction the chemical potential or pressure difference. Thank you. Well, the simple answer is we're still building this understanding and we don't know. But also the chemical potential affects the pressure difference. So uh, in, in a conventional theory, people have said uh, microwaves cause pressure buildup and rupture, but they haven't explained why. So we're attempting to explain why, and we think it's caused by this, driven by this chemical potential difference. But we haven't proved it yet, and we're still going to be working on that for years to prove prove it. It's true, we might be wrong. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Okay, then, then the next question is, do you have any experience how measure the temperature in microwave room correctly? I just answered the same question, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> so, okay, thank. I'm sorry. Okay, it's some miscommunication. Okay, and the next question is: Is there any catalyst needed, and is it necessary or not for some materials? And does it give significant difference to the result and the quality of the extracted stuff? Thank you. Catalyst. Yeah. Um, catalyst. I'm not aware of using catalysts for extraction. So for um, other reactions, people have used catalysts. Some, I mean, I think it's a really interesting area, which I know very little about. And we're always saying we're going to try doing it, but we haven't done it yet. It, and and it, it, also there's somebody, one of Shinta's other supervisors, Professor Derek Irvin, he is actually an expert in catalysis. So he can answer this question. So A, I'm not aware of using catalysts in extraction, but in reactions, yes. And you may get some selective heating of the catalyst. So actually, in fact, it could really enhance um, some reactions, but not in, not in extraction to my knowledge. Okay, thank you, doctor. And the next question, uh, what are the advantage of using microwave extraction compared to high pressure extraction? Thank you. <laughs> um, I wouldn't compare advantages and disadvantages. We've done some high pressure microwave extraction and we know the extraction time is much decreased. I refer you to the paper by Yu Jia Mao from Food Chemistry X. Um, I think I ref must have referred to it in the presentation. If not, I can supply the reference later. She, she looked at comparing sugar beet at atmospheric pressure and under pressure in the microwave. And while at atmospheric pressure, she got, I, I think maybe one, 120 minutes extraction time or a long extraction time anyway I can't remember exactly in high pressure she got like 10 minutes extraction time um, and so the extraction time and the yield is actually increased but the degradation is very fast so you have to um, really carefully understand the, the exact best time and the higher pressure and higher temperature you use the faster it happens but if you refer to that paper um, it, it's some really nice results comparing uh, atmospheric pressure and pressure reactions. But I can't say whether it's the microwave or not because we didn't do um, conventional high pressure experiments. Okay, thank you, doctor. And then, uh, and then last question maybe, 
can this tool be used to extract calus from rice to detect the production of antioxidants such as anthocyanin in that calluses? Thank you. Can you repeat the question? C can can it be used to? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Is the question, can we extract colours from rice like anthocyanin? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, OK. I, yeah. I, I, I have no experience of this, but it, in general, microwave extraction, it's just solvent extraction using a microwave. So it should anything you can do using normal solvent extraction, you can do using a microwave. And in most cases, the results are very similar. <laughs> but if you're very careful, you can get some advantages. OK. Okay, Yubi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Dina. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Thank you, uh, Yubi. Uh, so the next uh, question is from my colleagues who do the PhD uh, degree in Japan uh, to Bu Iza. Is there uh, Bu Iza there? No? Iza? Well, uh, maybe it's uh, loss, something loss. Okay. Uh, next question from uh, this team. Uh, maybe Puiza. Oh, okay. It's online. Puiza, do you have question for, for Dr. Uh, Eleanor? Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, they have a question. Can you put the microphone near your mouth? Put your microphone. Can you hear me? Can yes. You hear no. me? Oh. Oh. I no? didn't hear you. Sorry. Okay. It's very nice. Can you hear me? No. No. Sorry. Chick? Chick? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. What? Is there any... Um, kind of limitation in extraction or other process uh, regarding uh, regarding the choose of the uh, the choice of the solvent or material or the, uh, the micro processes. Is there any limitation? Because because I have maybe uh, uh, I have experience maybe a silly experience about microwave. Uh, I put some uh, food in microwave and uh, it suddenly burned. I don't know why. <laughs> is there uh, so? Is it related to the uh, choice of the solvent or material uh, to be uh, to be processed in micro? Yeah. Um. I think Rath, is there a limitation to the choice of solvent because you you put something in in a solvent and it burns. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, uh, I have a microwave. I don't know. Is is it the same microwave you use use uh, while you extract something or, or not? The whole microwave. So from that experience, so I think that uh, I think that it's maybe some relationship with the choice of uh, for the, uh, how we choose the material or solvent for the extraction of other. yeah or so I don't know. I, I, I think I understand what you're asking a bit. So I'll try to answer and tell me if you, I'm answering your question. So when you, and, and it's really what I've been trying to explain in the whole lecture is you can't just, like you're saying, do the same experiment for every single material. So you have to understand what the, the material is, what the sample is and what the solvent is, and then also what you're trying to do, what what, what conditions you really want to, to get the best results. So all the biomasses are different. Um, and obviously, I think the main difference is the, the solvent because of the dielectric properties. So you see, when we designed the potato extraction, we have very high dielectric properties. We have only a penetration depth of 1.2 centimetres. So we have to design a a continuous process like with a tube like this if you had hexane for a solvent it's microwave transparent so the penetration depth will be much bigger so you could design uh, maybe a multi-mode system which could heat quite effectively if you had hexane 
because and you would need a lot less energy because you just need to heat the biomass not so much the solvent mm -hmm. so yes indeed the the dielectric properties and the other properties of the system is really key to be understood before you design any process and this is important in any technology but especially important in microwave technology and this is why maybe it has a bad name because 20 years ago everybody said oh microwaves do these magical things let's build a bigger one and it didn't work <laughs> because it didn't understand all of these things so now in the last 10 years there's been a lot better understanding of how to design these processes and how they have to be bespoke you know they have to be designed for the specific materials and process that that's useful is that what you were asking oh um, yeah, yeah i mean uh what is actually the properties of the material uh that um, is, it, is it uh the electric properties uh are the electric properties or other maybe the color or the something or something like oh that? see um the, the color doesn't matter the Obviously, things like viscosity, thermal conductivity is very important. Usually, when we design microwave processes, the challenge is not the microwaving bit, it's the other bits that come around it, like uh, whether the material actually flows. And if the material changes properties during the experiment or during the process, does it become more viscous? You know, all of these things, does it burn? And, and trying to stop things burning. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Bu Iza. Um, thank you, Bu Iza, and thank you, thank you, Dr. Eleanor. And we have, we still have two so, uh, question. So yeah. maybe Yubi, you can uh, read the question. Okay, thank you, Ma'am Dina. And the next question is, have you ever done any research about lignin delignific i'm sorry lignin delignification on bioethanol production and what is the main challenge that you face on those research thank you <laughs> okay i i have done some research on lignin um but it's not for bioethanol production strangely enough it's for so i just um i had a phd student who's just finished um and in fact this is we hope this is a big research area, but it's not led by me. It's led by a lady called Professor Bettina Wolf, and she's moved to Birmingham University, but we collaborate closely. So what this project is, is, is using the, the ideas from bioethanol production. But what we have is uh, high lignin materials like um, brewer's spent grain, or in fact, they used cocoa husk as well for this shinter in the first paper. Um, what they discovered is that you can actually hydrothermally treat, so somebody else asked about high pressure. So lignin is um, extruded through the material or extracted from the material around 200 degrees. So you have to have a um, pressurised reactor, you have to heat to around 200, 220 degrees, and the lignin can then uh, move out of the material. And um, in the project we were looking at, we were then, because lignin is hydrophobic, it hits the water, and then when it cools down, it coalesces back onto the particles. So you ended up with these functionalized particles, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a brewer spent grain particle, which is covered in lignin, which is then like a hydrophobic particle. So the idea is that it can be used as a food additive uh, to stabilize emulsions, to stabilize oil in water emulsions because it's hydrophilic or amphiphilic, but with hydrophilic properties. Now, in fact, we had quite a lot of difficulty with this research. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't got there yet. Um, what we're now thinking of doing, and another PhD student as well, which I wasn't the supervisor of, she actually extruded the extracted the lignin from the particles, and she's done a lot of work on sol different solvents and everything to extract the lignin from the particles and then recoalesce them to be just particles. And then you can engineer the size and everything, and then they can be used. The idea is um, to stabilize emulsions in food or personal care products and this sort of thing. And this is an, another research area I'm interested in. And um, hopefully, in fact, next week we have an interview for a really big grant. So hopefully we will be doing more on that. But at the moment, we're not working on it. OK, good luck on your research, Dr. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> OK, and the final question. 
for this quest lecture. We have plenty of biomass resource in Indonesia. What do you think about the role of microwave extraction to obtain valuable chemicals in the future? Thank you. <laughs> well, I think I already explained how I feel about it. So uh, there are lots of ways you can use a microwave in what we refer to as a biorefinery. So I, I think I feel like it, the biggest challenge in, in, in using these valuable materials which are currently wasted is stabilizing them really quickly so we know that they degrade very quickly um I, we did a project with apple pomace because when people make cider in england it's very seasonal they just do it for two weeks and they have a massive amount of apples the apple pomace goes brown in less than five minutes so you need to stabilize it immediately to stop the enzymatic degradation so i think microwaves have a huge role there because they can um as I say, they can be a mobile process and we're talking about agriculture. So we have distributed feedstock. So microwaves can go to the site where the materials are. They can run on electricity, which means they can run on a generator. So they don't need, you know, huge amount of utilities to run these processes. So that that's what I really see um, microwaves having a big role. But then also within the biorefinery, if we can replace thermal energy with microwaves, for example, for extraction or conversion of lignin, all of these things, then we can move from fossil fuels to electricity. So renewable um renewable energy and therefore carbon reduction so that's i think it's very exciting yeah okay. thank you dr eliano thank you very much yubi for your uh question and for of the all of the question maybe uh can read we we can read so uh we have uh closed this uh lecture today so thank you very much for the wonderful challenging and interesting uh, lecture that we can learn today the conclusion of uh, today's guest lecture is very interesting that we can know that uh, dr ellie work on range of uh, multidisciplinary microwave processing projects focusing on the valorization of uh, food industry co-products for the production of a novel biochemical byproducts and about her current uh, project include hairy pectin extraction is very interesting from unconventional pectin feedstock and stabilization of a uh, field waste uh, is very impressive and is very interesting for us and so many questions but uh, we can we can read uh, all of the question and we are sorry about that so uh thank you for your uh lecture today dr ellie so thank so, you I want very to much. thank you i want to thank okay. you all for uh, <laughs> okay. inviting me and i thank everyone for listening as okay. well and some so, really very good questions mm -hmm. okay maybe you you have a question uh closing something like that you have Mm -hmm. I I feel like I already talked a lot. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm really pleased that you've invited me. All of the research we do, you see, we, we work on on with people from all over the world. We work, and this is why our research is so exciting because people like Shinta come and work with us. Um, you know, we have uh, students from Oman, from Mexico, um, England as well, obviously. You know, all, all uh, Spain. So so. We have a really uh, multidisciplinary research group, and that's what, why we get to do um, all this exciting research. So thank you to all for, for, for joining us. You're welcome, Ellie, Dr. Ellie. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, also for your active participation. Uh, certificate will be distributed within two days after this event. Uh, if you haven't uh, received the certificate within two days, please contact the committee. Uh, see you in the next international guest lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And see you. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.